Right. Uh, a warm welcome, everyone. My name is Axel Threlfall. I'm editor at large at uh, Reuters, based out of London. Uh, this session is the uh, envision envisioning, envisioning even the global role of the U.S. Uh, session. Um, it is a, a vast topic, but one that we're going to try and uh, shed some light on over the next 40 minutes or so. I, I won't spend too much time talking about the context. We all know it well enough that, that, that the changing uh, shape of global leadership, lots of dramatic and, and, and extremely oh. recent developments in the global uh, power balance. Uh, let me just mention a couple, of course, China and Russia's renewed authoritarian push, uh, Germany's newfound assertiveness uh, on the global stage uh, in light of Russia's moves on Ukraine, uh, or indeed the shifting um, balance in Asia with the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership and, and the uh, what transpired with the TPP. We've got to watch Ukraine very closely uh, and, and how the US and its allies to react what's happening there. I just, just came out of the, um, the opening session, the special session on, on Ukraine, you know, really fascinating to watch, very scary uh, to watch as well. But in this session, we ask, you know, what is the role of the U.S. now? You know, how has that role changed? What should it be? And I think importantly, what does the U.S. and the rest of the world want it to be? Let me uh, introduce um, my panel. Lisa Edwards is president and chief operating officer at Diligent Corporation. Uh, Chris uh, Gopala Krishnan, he's not with us just yet. He is chair of Axelor Ventures. He's going to join uh, from India in just a moment. Vinod Sekar, bottom left, chair and uh, group CEO of Petra Group out of Malaysia. And Michael Schwo, chair and uh, CEO of Schwo uh, USA. You know, w welcome uh, to all of you. Look, it, it is a really big subject. And I, I do want to start with, you know, with my news hat on, with the, with the news. Um, in, in his inaugural, I remember this well, in his inaugural address, Biden said he wanted the world to see the U.S. as a trusted partner for peace, progress and security. Um, why, Lisa, why, why do we think we, 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 we feel the need to question the U.S.'s role in the world right now, do you think? Sure. I, as you say, it's a gigantic topic. We could uh, we could go any number of ways with it. But I do think there is, um, you know, a, a half life to um, you know, to hegemony, if you will. And I think many called the end of that for the U.S. at the end of, at the financial crisis. Uh, um, and there's been, you know, sort of other other moves toward that sense. But I, I think you know, we we still look at the U.S. as a uh, as an economic power, as a military power. And, um, you know, I think that the question mark is, you know, as a moral power uh, a little bit in the world and where uh, and what the appropriate role is. Um, so, you know, it's. Uh, we, we had a short conversation uh, before going live on, you know, just the, the calling of the bluff and um, and to the extent which um, the United States now has the, um, the the willpower or, you know, sort of the will to um, to stand up and say uh, something mm -hmm. happening on the far on the other side of the world. It is worth our. Uh, you know, our, our, our investment in for, for whatever reason, and you can say it's short-sighted or not, but um, mm -hmm. I think that's the question mark of the day right now. But you, but you agree that we are right to be questioning the U.S.'s role, especially that, that moral bit. I do. I think so. I think, um, you know, we've, uh, we're, we're quite split politically, uh, you know, domestically. Uh, we have, you know, various opinions on, on how, you uh, you know how to engage uh, externally is it is it bridges or is it walls as they as they say um and everything is more interconnected than ever so um you know things like uh sanctions um can boomerang on you and can come back and uh impact uh, your own economy so i think that all of those factors are um putting a question mark around the the, the will to do it and i and 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 therefore you know, the rest of the world uh, mm. is probably right to look and question and say, you know, what do you, what are you guys up to over there? Yep. And I'm not sure. I'm not sure there's one answer. OK, you know, let me similar question to you again with that sort of, you know, why do we feel the need to ask this question that we're asking today as, as a sort of umbrella over this? How Biden handles the crisis uh, in, 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 in Ukraine um, is expected to have let's face it, 
pretty, I think, profound implications for his political and fortunes and relations with the rest of the world as well. How how would you been rate his handling of this so far? I know, of course, it depends on who you who you listen to and what you read. But what what is your thought? I mean, I can speak as a Malaysian. I'm sitting outside, very far away, looking at this going on, and we we all get impacted, right? This affects. Uh, global trade, it affects uh, logistics, it affects everything we're doing in one form or another. Um, honestly, we, I mean, from our perspective, um, the, the, the loss of confidence happened already when Afghanistan, the pull out of Afghanistan, that, that, that already started, right? Suddenly, we were looking at America pulling back. Now, the opposite of what we were expecting. Hmm. You know, we already had the pullback under Donald Trump. We already had the disengagement with the rest of the world uh, under that president. And there was an expectation that would be more, there would be more, uh, there'd be more global connection now. That they'll be reaching out to the rest of the world. And mm. we were not expecting America to go further back into the mm. thing. I'm a realist and I understand the issues in America and you know, Biden is fighting uh, politically. Uh, within and the we states. will come on to, we will come on to the right. domestic so, issues. So we see that, you know, we see that happening anyway. So we understand this, but it doesn't change the fact that this retraction into insularity, um, you know, what you say and all that is meaningless. It's what you do, you know, how you act. That, that's all that matters to us. I mean, we've, we've all heard speeches before. So now we want to see some action. Uh, and that lack of action, the lack of moving forward uh, to, to, you know, to go back to the TPC, uh, the, the global trade agreements, uh, that, that, the, trans, uh, like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP. Mm-hmm. Things like that, which he said he would do, but has made no real move towards trying to participate in new ones. This all sends a message that America is not ready. Either America doesn't have the the stomach or the hunger for this, and or they've decided to deal with their own their own thing. Now, I believe that's what's you know we historically we all look to America to say, look, you're the sheriff, right? What Australia said, you know, the sheriff of the world. We, you know, come and do the right thing. But we can I just say that. His history has 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 looked has this has happened once before. I mean, it's been many times before. But if we look at the Cuban Missile Crisis, for example, how was it resolved in the end, with all the quiet talk behind? It was resolved in the end when America promised Russia, "We will not invade Cuba. We will not uh, allow anyone else to invade Cuba. We will not participate with anyone invading Cuba. We will not go in." And that was that was the agreement with Russia move away. Uh, and uh, I guess America gave up some missiles in, 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 in Turkey, Turkey or something. But that was the main thing. So what's happening now is almost a reversal of that, of that, of that situation uh, in, in Ukraine. This is all very unfair to the Ukraine people, right? This is all very unfair to innocent people that are dying with bombs being thrown on them because Putin's gone a bit crazy. But again, going back to your question about, about America, yeah, there is a loss of confidence. I mean, there is a tremendous loss of confidence on, on, on normal Malaysians, Southeast Asians, that just feel that you know, America has promised to lead and we're not seeing any leadership. Yeah. Okay, good. Michael, let me just get a, a general thought from you on this um, uh, as well. You know, I, I, I know you, you obviously you wear the, you know, a real estate hat and, and you can talk to the, uh, the economics and economic leadership to a degree. So it's a little unfair of me to ask whether you think he's doing a good job in, with the Ukraine crisis. But, but from where you're sitting, where, where is the leadership left, do you think, uh, when it comes to, to Joe Biden and, and his Democratic Party? It's actually, it's, <clears throat> sorry, good morning. It's interesting because when you're actually looking at the actions that the U.S. has taken so far, I um, mean, really the rest of the world, you know, with, clearly with leadership uh, uh, from the U.S. on the Ukraine uh, uh, crisis, it's all been economic actions, right? I mean, so... <clears throat> Well, you know, I agree that there's the conversation, is America the sheriff of the world? It's also the question, what bullets is that sheriff carrying, right? So is, is America's goal to come there and, and the minute that there's a, a crisis, to land our troops there and, and to fight wars for every country? Again, I'm, I'm by far not the qualified person to tell you that. I could tell you one man's opinion. Um, I think that, that what, what Biden's trying to do right now, and obviously he's going, he has a big problem at home, right? Because at the end of the day, we talk about America, but we remember that this is all run by human beings that want to get reelected and in, in, in our thinking about there's different, different reasons why, 
why 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 politicians do what they do. But it seems like right now the the, the strategy is let's hit them economically and let's get the really wealthy guys that are supporting Putin right now to take him down. That's mm. what it feels like, right? I mean, why are you going in 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 and, and going after boats of the wealthiest guys in, 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 in Russia. I mean, what are you going to do with those boats, right? So you're trying to hurt the wealthiest people. So there is probably a thought that somebody's going to wake up and, and, try, and try to do something from within. Um, it doesn't seem like any of that is working at the moment, and, and that might be a longer-term play. The issue that we're, we're contending with right now, that we're all watching every day, I mean, you, you know, last night we all watched the, the nuclear plant go on fire, and... and I mean, it's it's a it's a colossal mess right now, and I don't think that you know. I think the U.S. US is trying not to get the world into World War Three, right? Because the minute the U.S. takes a military action, we're all kind of doomed. Um, you know, the 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 one question about is uh, I believe you know the gentleman was asking um, is the U.S.'s role to be the sheriff? Are we are we is it really a role to do that? But it goes back to, to, and I'm bringing this back to the economic investment. We all want the world to invest in America. Why do people invest in America? They invest in America because we are, the, the as you said, we are the trusted partner. What is it for, 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 for peace, for security and things of that nature, right? So, you know, part of the, part of America's strategy over years to, to really be the leader is to give that, that confidence to the world that we're here, whatever okay. happens. It's obviously changed through Trump, and we could talk about this forever, but I'll let you go to your next question. Okay, no, but, but clearly, Michael, you think that leadership is there on, and, you know, you know uh, yeah, uh, the perception of foreign investors in the U.S. Uh, is, uh, is, is, is intact. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a safe, stable place to invest, and, and as a result, that sort of economic leadership is still intact, is your view. I, I, I think, and I'm going to say something that's maybe not, you know, a, a popular thing to say, but when you see what happens in, in Europe, it actually makes America stronger from an investment point of view. Because mm-hmm. we are, again, we are looked at as a safe place. We are looked at as a, as a, as a stable place. Right now, Europe is in shambles. Asia is in shambles. Um, so, yes, I mean, I think that the U.S. is obviously leading, leading you know, economically, but, but this still doesn't solve the humanitarian issue, which, which is really yeah. what, what we're all... Right, what yeah. we're all concerned about. All right, um, good. Yeah, yeah right. Th- thanks, Michael. Chris, welcome. Uh, you, you, you found a, a stable connection. I, I'm glad. Um, just very quickly on the back of what's just said, you, you clearly Biden is caught between, you know, I guess wanting to be na- nationalistic, if you like, in his foreign policy, ending forever wars, and not quite being able to give up um, the role as, as as the force for rules based internationalism. My guess is this. this space where they're where he's stuck at the moment chris let me let me ask you um how would you i mean it's a big question this one it's a big subject we're discussing but how would you characterize the 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 american models one of development two of 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 democracy because as as you've said and i know you've said this they are both at a a very uh uh uh, real crossroads right now and you know when um I send you that message when we, uh, when the panel was set up, uh, clearly, you know, the, the situation in Europe had not developed. And this um, did, does change the, um, you know, the discussion, but um, it does not change, um, you know, my, um, my take on this subject that much. It probably reinforces my views, and let me explain this. Actually, uh, there is absolutely um, no doubt uh, in my mind, and you know, Michael, um, you know, when you look at uh, economy, U.S. is the largest economy. Um, U.S. is uh, the oldest democracy in the world, um, and and from a development perspective, from a democracy perspective, you know, based on any uh, parameter. Um, U.S. has done extremely well, and the world has done extremely well uh, over the last uh, probably century uh, because we have the largest number of countries uh, having democracies, and the global economy has almost touched $100 trillion. Now, where I'm coming from is, um, you know, in spite of all this, 
there are disparities. The disparities are increasing. Uh, the development is not reaching every state or every um, person in the world. And let me take the example of uh, COVID first. And, mm -hmm. and if you look at what U.S. did extremely well is used its power, especially money power, to uh, develop the vaccine for the world. The RNA technology was, um, which was in the lab was brought to market in an amazingly fast, you know, very short period of within one year, mm -hmm. uh, you know, under emergency use authorization, um, you know, people were getting the jabs and not just in US, but <clears throat> some other developed countries also. But the develop, developing world was left behind because the vaccine uh, could not be used in developing worlds because of the logistics issue. You know, it required uh, cold storage at minus 35 or something like that. Yeah. And the cost was too high. Now, India <clears throat> luckily got the Oxford vaccine and manufactured the vaccine and brought the cost down to about $3 per shot. And 1.5 billion P, um, vaccines have been given to date by a, <clears throat> by a poor country, a developing country, because the cost was brought down. So, you know, if U.S. had gone the extra step of saying that, can we look at an mRNA technology that can be transported at room temperature, can we manufacture this under license in a, in a lower cost economy like India? You know, even today, the uh, Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine is not licensed to India to manufacture. Mm -hmm. We could have brought the cost down. So, you know, that extra step is what I believe U.S. can do, must do, and that mindset must be there. You cannot look at profit only as the motivation yeah, yeah, you need to okay. look at development of you know everybody yeah. um, and, 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 and that's the difference and even if you look at the crisis now see sometimes we will not get the perfect solution we will not get the ideal solution can we take three steps four steps five steps mm -hmm. to get to the solution right um, so maybe we should have done more to um secure peace rather than democracy first maybe yeah. okay. because okay. every country and every state and every culture may not be ready at this point or may not want you know ultimately people deserve get the government they deserve right what, 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 yeah let me let me let me chris let me interrupt you and i'll come back on the democracy bit i mean you talked about development you talked about um equitable development. Lisa, let me ask you, what, res what responsibility, and I, 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 can, I can foresee the response here, but what facility, responsibility rather does the, the US have in making the world a more equitable place? Well, again, I think that goes straight to the question of what the, you know, whether the, the, the US wants to continue to have the role of, uh, you know, sort of moral leadership in the world. Um, and certainly there, are, I, I agree with Chris, as, you know, said that, that the pandemic is one of the many things that pointed out, um, you know, some of those equality issues, but also that those equality issues are, um, again, that, that unintended consequences in the boomerang effect of, you know, uh, if you do not treat the rest of the world, do, uh, do you then create the, an opportunity for a variant to thrive and, and come back um, and then continue uh, and continue your problem? And, um, you know, I, I, I do think that there has been moves by, in particular, China to take on investment uh, um, opportunities around the world, building bridges and, and roads and infrastructure projects. Um, and you see those as you go around the world, particularly in Africa and Latin America. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so I, I think there's a real question of, you know, be, you can call it for, for moral reasons and sort of a rising tide uh, to lift all boats, or you can call it uh, in self-interest and not wanting to have uh, a big Chinese presence in some of these areas. Um, it, it seems to me that, that it's something that the U.S. should at least be looking at. It's clear, uh, Vinod, that, you know, as, as Lisa said, that China, and we talk about this endlessly, China filling the vacuum. Um, 
it's happening quickly. It's been happening for a while. Is that, you know, at the expense of players like the US, mainly the US, is, that, is there any way back? No, oh, absolutely. Let's, let's be very clear here. Um, the US has a lot of advantages that it's not using uh, with the rest of the world. N number one, the US is without question the world's largest uh, aid provider. All right. Um, the US gives, I can't remember the exact amount, 30 something odd billion US dollars a year in, in aid. Um, the problem is they don't give sustainable aid, um, you know, and they they involve too much politics in how they give the aid. And even worse, you talked about moral leadership. You can't talk about moral leadership. How is that, you know, a moral here the same as the moral here? You know, as, as Chris said, we all live in different cultures, different dynamics, different customs, you know, and democracy is the third thing you deal with. You first fill stomachs, you fill minds, democracy yeah. will follow automatically, all right? So they need to go there and actually do something that makes a difference. Go build schools, hospitals, roads, infrastructure. China's doing this, and they're doing it well in Africa. I mean, they're, they're doing it everywhere. And it's soft power, but it's very powerful soft power because they're giving what the people need and what the countries mm. need. Here's a question to you. Why is it, despite the fact that the U.S., and I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of the U.S., I, I'm educated in the United States. I have close friends. I have businesses in the U.S., uh, sprawling there. So, but let me ask this question. Why, despite the fact that the U.S. is the world's largest aid provider, by far, without any question, why is it then so unloved by all these companies that re countries that receive this aid? Why, why isn't that, isn't that, why aren't these countries saying, oh, wonderful, thank you so much. You know, you know we want to do more with the U.S. And, and I think... think Wrong yeah, with that. Right? Do you think there's something wrong with that? And I think that's about sustainable aid giving. How you do it, why you do it, and how long you stay to finish it off. And you said in a, in a, in our call a couple of days ago, you know, on the democracy bit, Western democracy doesn't translate to the rest of the world as as, yeah. as well as some people, especially Americans, feel that it does. Yes, um, I think that's a that's another issue. I mean, in, in you know, in light of what you've just said, let me put put this question to, to you: Is it? Is it the responsibility, should it be the responsibility of major Western democracies to make democracy appealing again? Um, the, the, you know, clearly the U.S. needs to bolster, demo to bolster democracy at home. It needs to then bolster the democratic alliances it has around the world. Are you confident that the U.S. can play that role in bolstering democracy? You asking anyone or just... Yeah, yeah. No, go ahead. Let's start okay, with you. I mean, Chris, so, Chris, yes, on. if you can take the politics and the morality out. I mean, when I say morality, I don't mean the general right, but you know, you cannot, again, as we said earlier, you cannot take what you believe is right in your country and translate it to another country, translate it to a third world developing country, uh, translate it to a place where most people are still living uh, hand to mouth, mm. uh, where education is not available, where women are not getting education to the levels that they should, uh, where there's a lot more work to do. Uh, but the U.S. can play a tremendous role by saying, OK, you know what? We're going to take it a step at a time. We're going to provide the money to make sure there are schools. We're going to give them the support. We're going to give them the, the, the incentives to keep changing and evolving. And we're going to stay. You know, we're going to stay and see it through. Yeah. Is it hard, Chris, to, for the U.S. To, 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 to have that, to, to carry that responsibility um, to make and you know I use this very loosely democracy appealing again when when let's face it at home there is a massive loss of faith in democracy and elections and election results um how are you, how tough is that role on the global stage when when in our own backyard things look a pretty ropey right now so you know it's just not in US alone we have um, um, you know somewhat uh, difficult times in many countries with democracy today uh, U.S., um, you know, uh, everywhere there is no middle. You know, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's extremes only at this point. You know, either you are at the right or you are at the left extreme, but there's no middle uh, ground or seemingly middle ground. Parliamentary or, um, you know, uh, the, the, well, I think the word is parliamentary uh, process seems to fail because you can't agree on anything and, 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 uh, uh, ultimately, the brute majority only wins, actually. And and, and this is true in um, U.S. It's true in uh, many of the European countries. Um, 
It's true in Asia, in India, it's true. And so um, what we need to think about is, you know, democracy is a work in progress, right? So we need to figure out how to um, look, see, and, and I think partly the challenge is suddenly technology and social media has uh, made it very difficult to take a middle position because you get beaten up immediately, instantaneously uh, by, you know, all the people who um, are vocal, maybe yeah. it's only the 2% or the 3%, but they are the people who are on vocal. <clears throat> and so then you're forced to take extreme positions. So we have to figure out how to make democracy work in a world where social media um, is, you know, at, a, at, a, at the fingertips for everybody. And and I think the reason why, again, I look at US is um, because it's already a developed country, the, some of the compulsions that, um, um, you know, Vinod talked about are not there in the US, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, in India, like he said, we need to figure out, you know, how to how to feed the people, how to give them health care, how to give them education, etc. In the US, many of those issues are taken care of. So it can actually, with and it's wealthy, right? So it can actually try with some experiments. It, so, you know, it, why didn't it take, um, take uh, action against uh, uh, the, the social media companies, etc. early on, rather than wait till everything broke before action was taken, right? So mm -hmm. that's what I'm coming at. Yeah. These experiments and these proactive measures, US has to lead today. Okay, um, Lisa and, uh, and, and Michael, I mean, you're, 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 you're there in the US. Um, you know, we, we talk about a loss of faith in elections, uh, in election results, you've got the midterms coming up. It, it looks pretty gloomy right now, I would say, for, um, for, 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 the, for, for the Democrats. How, you know, and we talk about moral compasses, leadership, uh, you know, building democracy back at home when there's no center anymore. How, Michael, let me start with you. What, what, what does it feel like from where you're sitting, uh, you know, with your business hat on? And, and say, same to you, Lisa. Lisa, do you want go to ahead, start? Michael. No, go ahead. Okay. Um, look, I, mean, I, I just, <clears throat> I want to touch just back on, on, on just, on the conversation you guys just had, which is kind of fascinating because, you know, we're sitting in the U.S. and, and you're hearing kind of the, the foreign opinion, if, if I may say, of, of the U.S. I think that the challenge with this whole question of this panel, what's the role of the U.S.? On one side, you know, the, the foreign countries want U.S. To, to support them when there's issue. On the other side, they don't want to get involved in, in, in running the country. There's, there's, you know, in kind of, as you say, implement, implement our call it our, our democracy or bring our democracy to, 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 to the outside world. It's a very fine line between what, you know, the take and the give here. And again, I don't think we, I don't want to get into this myself, but I think that that is really the core of the problem is, you know, if, if, if the U.S. steps in, half the people think, you know, we shouldn't be there because it's not your business. Don't come in. But then we should support on specific issues. And I agree that U.S. should definitely support the world on humanitarian causes, not I don't, I don't, not because of it's a responsibility or not, because it's just the right thing to do. And, and it, it, it goes back to the basic thing. If I have money and you don't have money and you're suffering, I should help you. Right. And that's, that's just, if it's a country, if it's a human being, if it's somebody on the street that's asking for money because they don't have food. So, but I'm going to answer your question. I'm sorry on, 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 yeah, on, on the business side. Look, we've, as, as I, as I mentioned to you, when we spoke, we've been seeing, uh, um, you know, the interesting thing about this, the, the, what Putin did here is that Putin single-handedly finished COVID. Did you notice that nobody talks about COVID? There's no COVID anymore. Uh, when was the last time anybody spoke about COVID? It's all Ukraine, right? But, but if, if, if Putin didn't do what he did here, we would be speaking today about kind of the, the, the role of the U.S. kind of exiting from COVID, right? We, last year when we spoke, or I was on a panel here, there was a question of what is the U.S. doing to help the rest of the world in COVID, which... We did good stuff in some cases. We really sucked in other cases. But uh, um, but but the recovery out of COVID, you know, I, I think from from anywhere in the world, the U.S. Was probably came out of COVID better than 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 elsewhere. And we're seeing that, 
you know, we're seeing that economically here. I mean, you can see that in the stock market. You can see that from my side on real estate prices and in rents, right? I mean, you're seeing today real estate prices at peak numbers in the U.S. You're seeing rents at peak numbers. And it's driven by kind of this, this and, and it's the same thing with retailers and every business that we're seeing right now operating in the U.S., uh, major businesses, because there's been two years where half the world sat at home, saved money in the U.S. A lot of people got unemployment um, that was way higher than what, what their salary was, but they didn't have the spending. So the ratio of, of, of saving here has gone drastically up, and we're seeing a true kind of boom within the economy. But we're also seeing something now that started probably in November of last year, um, um, a true spike in, in foreign investment in the U.S., right? And, and, and I talked earlier about the U.S. as a global economic leader. U.S. is still looked at, beside the fact that we're the largest economy, it's looked like a safe place to be. We're seeing today a lot of European, you know, uh, um, European investment in the U.S. We're seeing some Asian investment, some South American, but really with the idea that the U.S. is kind of the global leader um, and, and, and safer than anywhere else you could be, particularly post-pandemic. Okay, my, my, Lisa, this is same same question to you. I mean, again, as a, as a business leader in the U.S., you know, doing business with 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 uh, many nations around the world, what what how's it changed over the past year? Would you say? You know, I think. Well, first of all, I, I think um, I do think that the 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 sanctions do have unintended consequences. So I'm not sure that I fully agree with Michael on. Uh, that creates, you know, the U.S. as a safe harbor for, or the USD as a safe harbor uh, in that, uh, yes, for Western economies, but if for an economy that fears uh, sanctions, uh, you could see them saying, like, hold on a second, I didn't realize they could go after that there in that way. So I do think there could be some downstream implications of that as well. I do agree, though, that the economy feels like it's sort of, you know, it's back in the United States to a certain extent, uh, notwithstanding the market going up and down a lot, um, you know, in the early part of this year. Um, the uh, the midterm elections are going to be sporty, I think. I, 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 I do think that, um, you know, the pendulum here tends to go back and forth a bit. So uh, it's not unusual for the midterm elections to sort of reverse uh, the, uh, you know, the, depending on what side of the argument you're on, the, the gains or losses of the, of the prior election. Um, so I, I think, you know, that it's highly anticipated that, that, that was going to happen here again, where, uh, you know, there would be more of a Republican presence, uh, after the midterm elections. Yeah. I do think that the current events though, are putting some of that into question. So if you, uh, if you simply just look at the, uh, the former president's statements about Putin and Russia, um, it, that felt like a, a, a safe place uh, to be for, for the right of the of political parties in the United States two weeks ago. It doesn't feel as safe now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think it's created a little chaos. Um, you know, is it enough chaos to to disrupt the normal sort of back and forth swing of the pendulum between uh, right and left in the United States? I don't know, but those extremes have gotten bigger. Um, so it, it's become uh, it's become sort of more uh, more acute. But but yeah. but still fairly normal um you know um okay thanks lisa yeah i you know i've got a wary eye on the time and um and i i know we have to finish on time but i back back you know reading about u.s foreign policy a couple of quotes really jumped out at me it's got to rediscover its moral and strategic resolve there's an experimental quality to its foreign policy this foreign policy is frustratingly inelastic and then and then I read this, the US-led world order died in Afghanistan on August 30th, 21, three days shy of its 76th birthday, you know, caused self-inflicted wounds. Uh, what, 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 you know, what, what does the US want its role to be right now, do you think? I think there's an assumption that US is, from the perspective of, of the rest of the world, is one country. Um, and I don't believe it is. Uh, U.S. is one, obviously one country, like many of us are one, you know, one country. But I think its uh, ideals, its aspirations, are very, very different. If you if you look at the different states and and the different parties and the different political alignments and beliefs, uh, etc. I would just say this: I, I think U.S. needs to be a leader of the world. I, I think that, that is something the U.S. needs as part of its makeup. Uh, let's be honest here. 
it is it, it is it is the framework the United States of America requires. Uh, it's what it's been built on and what it stands for. Um, that is not necessarily a bad thing. That is you know for for what the U.S. stands for and its principles. It's a good thing. Uh, it's the application of that, obviously, as we discussed earlier. Uh, how is it implemented uh, around the world? And that, that's the tough part uh, because the world is so different. But here's the challenge. If the U.S. doesn't take leadership now, um, it cannot assume it'll maintain it because China is catching up really fast. And behind China, and I don't know if Chris agrees with me, India will come. Yeah. India will grow and India will take a position where it won't be a poor nation. And it's not a poor nation. It just has a lot of poor people. <laughs> but, you know, it also has the population of the United States as a middle class. <laughs> okay. In fact, it has, it has a larger population in the United States as a middle class. So its growth is there. If, if it gets going, then you have these two nations that make nearly half the world, or yeah. just over a third of the world, coming forward. Now, if they start replacing what America wants to do, then you suddenly find America losing its leadership luster mm. in the rest of the world, or, it, or, it, or its influence. Now, yeah. whether that's a good or bad thing is up to everyone to, to look at and, and decide, but this is a reality. It's happening now. You yeah. can see well, it in Africa. Africa. You can see it in Africa. You can see it in many, many... You can even see it in Malaysia, where they're funding most of our railways. They're, they're buying a lot of our energy companies. I mean, it's happening now. So, and it's happening all over the place. So the question is, at what stage does suddenly... America and Korea, my gosh, yeah, China, India, and, the other and, countries everywhere. And very importantly, Chris, okay, Bernard says at what stage, how long have they got? You know, how long have they got? You know, we talk about America having to, you know, act quickly to reinvent itself right now. How long has it got before China does take that mantle? Well, does, you know, let, me, let me approach this differently. See, every country will look at the the world from its own perspective and um, self-interest comes first and self-interest is what drives individuals and countries and us is i think no different um, and 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 the 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 challenge is when you look at uh, uh, self-interest if you're driven by short term uh, then you take the wrong decisions. You have to think about medium term and long term. And we need the space to look at medium term and long term. I think that's the challenge. So when, you know, when we say it's moral, combust, etc., I don't completely buy into that because, you know, U.S. supports many dictators. U.S. supports many autocratic regimes. It's not imposing democracies in all those places. So what it looks at is, you know, it's self-interest and, and, and rightly so. So what I look at is, you know, yes, self-interest is fine, but self-interest with a little bit of medium to long-term view is what is required in today's world. And that's what is missing. And that's where I believe democracies are failing. We are all driven by election cycles. And in the U.S., election cycles are two years now, right? Yeah. Not even four years. Yeah. And so we, we and, and in the social media, it's instantaneous, right? You have to respond tomorrow morning before... You know, you get um, inundated by negative messages and you suddenly feel that you are the enemy of the world, actually. So these are the things, challenges. And, and, and again, I come back to, you know, the self-interest of U.S. is to find a solution, not for the world, for itself also. And, you know, will China and India become large? Yes, it, they will become large. But will it have the same... Um, See, what the U.S. has is the aspirational uh, position in the world. Mm. Today, for anybody, anywhere in the world, where do you send the ch your child to school? It's the U.S. Mm. You know, where does technology come from? It's the U.S. You know, where, does, where do you look for the best entrepreneurs? It's the U.S., right? So, but it, 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 it has to now realize that to retain these and to have that moral authority, it should look at medium to long term. And okay. that moral authority is also self-interest, I feel. Okay. Uh, and, and that's the difference. You know, if China comes forward, its self-interest will dominate its decisions. In the case of US, I think it's moderated to some extent. And that's where people look up to US. That's where opportunities are, etc. It's very open. Open yeah. culture, open, 
uh, you know, other plays are not like that. You know, um, you know. Sorry, if I, I think I, it's an interesting comment, though, right? Because if you yeah. talk about playing the long ball, um, it does feel like both Russia and China are in a better position to do that, uh, partially because of the form of government they have, that they are not as beholden to a democratic cycle uh, and getting swapped out after two years. Uh, and 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 that and and that you know i think it was your your countryman uh axel that said uh you know democracy is the worst form of government except all the others but in this particular case and in the ability to sort of stay the long game um uh you know china has and and, and russia both have um you know kind of shown more ability to do that whether you agree with the you know with the way they do it or not do you worry how, how worried are you i mean how long you know i asked i asked you know the question oh chris the question yeah. How long are you going? You know, how patient can we be with them? I, I, I think I, I agree with Vino you know, that it's a little bit, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a little bit like putting the frog in the pot. Like if you throw the pot, in the, you know, the frog in the pot of hot water jumps out. But if you just sort of increase the temperature a little bit over time, all of a sudden you have cooked frog. The temperature is increasing. Like it's uh, there are things going on around the world that have. Um, and, and I agree with the earlier comments on Afghanistan as well in terms of mm -hmm. um, that was, I think, shocking to see. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there would you would probably. I don't know if uh, uh, I don't know what um, Michael thinks, but I, I don't think there's a ton of people who probably would have uh, disagreed with. Okay, this sort of is going nowhere, and we need to pull out. But the manner and the and the just the 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 way it was done uh, was just so ugly and 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 just yeah. poorly organized and not what a you know not not what you think a global leader does. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I think, I don't know, you know, is it, is it 10 years? Is it 50 years? Um, I, mm -hmm. I, I don't think, I don't think anyone's going to be able to pin that, that number, but it's very clear that, um, you know, between things like investments and, uh, and, you know, looking around the world and where the, and where the growth rates are around the world, it's, um, you know, it's the, the, the countries growing fastest are Southern Africa. Mm -hmm. um, I don't so, forget. Yeah, and don't forget, Axel, the, at the end of the day, the size of the economies as well. We talk about America being the largest economy, but right now, I mean, let, let's look at rubber compound, for example. You know, um, you know, one of our companies sells recycled rubber compounds. Our biggest market right now that we're attacking and targeting is China, not the US. Mm -hmm. They use more rubber compound now, we start rubber compound than anywhere else, and they want it at huge amounts. Now, just like that, all other raw materials are now being in demand for China. So slowly as there are 90 million, you know, they've got about 90 million, 120 million uh, middle class right now, if you, if you don't call it middle class, but with cash. And that number is growing by huge percentages every year. So when you say how much time we have, you're seeing it happen right now from a from a market standpoint, from from what, what you just mentioned in terms of the frog in the bottle and slowly, you know, uh, in, in the pot slowly heating up. You're right. That's been going on for a while. It's happening in Malaysia. It's happening in Sri Lanka. It's happening everywhere in africa it's it's it's, it's really happening it's happening it, it's been happening um and it you can't really stop it i mean mm. china can stop you can't really stop you can try and replace it but it, it it's hard because they're going there they're not asking for much they're doing economic deals they're providing the cash why because they are as you've said playing the long game they're playing chess not checkers you know they they're not looking at they don't care if they lose a pawn or a, or a bishop or a castle they want the whole board <laughs> and they're willing to wait and, and play the strategic game uh, and unlike other democracies that, you know, uh, India being one of them as well, that, that constantly fights every five years or four years to stay in power, um, China doesn't, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And at least with previously before uh, this current president of China, you know, you at least knew that you had 10 years. That's it. Then there'll be a change of president. Well, this guy's just essentially made him president for life. Now, Putin's done the same thing for himself, <laughs> obviously. Uh, with, with what he's doing now. So, you know, this is the challenge that democracy, that America and, and many other countries that, that are like America face, yeah. dealing yeah. with the world, uh, world the world as it is. I think, Axel, one, <clears throat> sorry, one thing we need to finish. You know, I, as, as, as you said, you want to send your kids to school in America. I don't think anytime soon in any of our lifetime we're going to want to send our kids to school in Russia or in China. Oh, you're right. wrong. You're wrong. Large well, numbers of Asians. Uh, you, know, you, talked about, you talked about Southeast Asia. You think that uh, US, Indonesia is one of the fastest growing economies here. They're building a new capital and there's huge amounts of money coming. And here's the thing. I was shocked. My nephew, and I was completely shocked. My nephew has decided to leave Duke and to go to a university, a British university, granted a British university, but a British university in China. And, and they have about a thousand big and there are huge numbers going there to learn Mandarin 
to be involved in the Chinese economy. So I think we can't take that for granted. Yes, I'm an American educated uh, individual. I want my children went to went to the UK and I want them to do their masters in the US. But that's my thinking, my my era, my age group. But there's a different thinking going on now, especially in Asia, in, in, in terms of where they can go and what opportunities they have. Learning mm-hmm. Mandarin, learning mm-hmm. how to and I, I don't think we can take it for granted anymore. It's and a, I, you I, know, we've just opened a fascinating <laughs> area of this discussion. <laughs> just as we're at time, you know, which is a, which is a real shame. We could we'll debate that over, over a Zoom call. Right, but anecdotes like that, Vinod, are what really make discussions like this. You know, your nephew leaving Duke to go to a university in China uh, to learn Mandarin. Etc. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I, 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 I agree with you. We can't underestimate uh, 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 that. But look, um, I, I do have to stop. We are at time. Um, I said it was a big subject. I feel we've scratched a tiny, tiny piece of this. Uh, but I want to thank all of you, Lisa Edwards, Gopala Krishnan, uh, Vinod Sekhar, and Michael Shvo, uh, for, for all of your time. Um, hopefully we can pick a conversation like this up again next year and see where we are. Uh, five years from now, see where we Very are. Very nice so, to meet all of you. Thanks a lot to all of you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.